But what happened gradually is as the welfare state values have been spreading, it is spreading a culture of poverty and a culture of violence. I want to read to you, Leon Dash wrote a tremendous book called When Children Want Children, The Urban Crisis of Teenage Childbearing. Now I want to read two quick passages, but it, it is absolutely an astonishing work. He says, I began my research into adolescent childbearing. Let me, let me back up. Leon Dash is a black reporter, African American reporter at the Washington Post, who was required to do this book to live in a public housing area for 18 months in an apartment, going out, listening to and probing people, trained by the greatest investigative reporter of our time, Bob Woodward, who insisted he go back again and again and again. This is what he says. I began my research into adolescent childbearing burdened with adult presumptions. I assumed that the high incidence of teenage pregnancy among poor black urban youths nationwide grew out of youthful ignorance, both about birth control methods and adolescent reproductive capabilities. I also thought the girls were falling victim to cynical manipulation by the boys, although the number of babies born to adolescent girls appeared to be awfully high for this to be the dominant pattern. Remember, this is a black reporter who lived in the system. I was wrong on all counts. I want to repeat this because since all modern welfare state policies based on the preceding paragraph, and all of the recent Surgeon General's arguments are based on the preceding paragraph, listen to his conclusion. I was wrong on all counts. Among the adolescents in Washington, D.C. whom I interviewed, I found the teenage boys and girls as young as 11 knew more about sex, birth control, and their reproductive abilities than I had known at the same age. Others had had extensive school courses in sex education in the sixth or seventh grade. I found that the girls, far from being passive victims, were often equal or greater actors than their boyfriends in exploring sexuality and becoming pregnant. The girls were as often the leaders in their desire to have a child as the boys were. I did not find one adolescent couple where both partners were ignorant about the results of sexual activity without the use of contraception. In time, it became clear that for many girls in the poverty-stricken community of Washington Highlands, a baby is a tangible achievement in an otherwise dreary and empty future. I want to repeat this sentence because it's so powerful. A baby is a tangible achievement in an otherwise dreary and empty future. It is one way of announcing, I am a woman. For many boys in Washington Highlands, the birth of a baby represents an identical rite of passage. The boy is saying, I am a man. The desire for a child was especially acute among adolescents who were doing poorly in school. They knew implicitly and had been told explicitly that they were not likely to graduate from high school. These were the youths aged 15 to 17 and still in the seventh grade who were at highest risk to get pregnant or father a child. While the better students strove for a diploma, the poorer students achieved their form of recognition with a baby. If the crisis of black teenage parents was simply a matter of ignorance, then it might be relatively easy to solve but poor academic preparation that begins in elementary school, the poverty that surrounds them, and social isolation from mainstream American life motivate many of these boys and girls to have children. The only other point I would say, say to you is that he estimated that on average, it took him, this is Leon Dash, African American, reporter at the Washington Post. On average, it took four months for him to get a girl to tell him the truth. That he listened and asked, listened and asked, came back a week later, listened and asked, four months. Which says what about most of your academic studies, most of your newspaper reporting, and most of your government surveys? They're useless. They're totally misleading. Leon Dash, I, until I'd read Alaska, I thought this was one of the most powerful books. It's a great book, and Leon Dash did great work, and, and uh, deserve, he has a new, book, a new report coming out, because he's gone back into the, the period before urban uh, poverty to look at it, and, uh, but it's a great, great work. The, ar the argument I'm trying to suggest here to you is that given what he's saying, this is not about birth control education, that in fact personal strength is the key to replacing the culture of poverty. If you really want to replace the culture of poverty, you've got to focus on personal strength and you've got to redesign the entire system to focus on personal strength. Now we're going to spend two hours on this later on. But let me, let me, for today's purpose, outline for you nine vision level principles for personal strength. First, will this proposal have pe help people become more responsible, you'll notice we did this earlier, more productive and more safe so they can be prosperous and free so they can pursue happiness. Every time a proposal is clearly going to undermine responsibility and productivity 
you ought to say to yourself, why are we doing this? If you went through the current welfare state and every single item which undermined personal strength was eliminated, you'd replace about 80% of the welfare state overnight because it is actively destructive. It's not that it's failing to help, it is actually undermining because it is sending the wrong signals. Second, everyone must have full citizenship and that includes both the rights and responsibilities. That means when you see a homeless person, you say, fine, I'll go halfway. But you've got to go halfway. You see somebody who is poor sitting there, 17 years of age, doing nothing? We will help you, but then you have to help yourself today. By the way, every successful program says it starts today. Not two years, not six months, today. Work begins day one. I just met with the sister who's in charge of Covenant House, which is a Catholic charity that has 41,000 girls a year who come through it. She said, our principle is simple. You have to work the first day. No other system works. So when you hear somebody say, well, get around to it. You have two years to sit around and wait, and then we'll start. Well, if you're going to start, why wait two years? Why ruin two years of their life? Why entrench deeper the habits of not doing things? Three, everything costs something. There is no free lunch. And as a citizen, you have some obligation to help out a little at all times. The 19th century tradition was to have a wood pile next to the mission house, and when the homeless showed up, they cut wood before they ate. Because if you wouldn't cut wood, you weren't prepared to do your share. And they cut wood both for themselves and for one widow, because you have an obligation to have dignity by contributing. Think about that model compared to the current model. Again, that's Olasky. Four. Reward what you want to encourage. Punish or make more expensive what you want to discourage. How's that for turning the welfare and tax codes on their head? You want to reward savings? Make it tax-free. What do we do? We punish savings and we reward credit. We go through the whole list. You want to reward entrepreneurship? Make it advantageous. You want to reward going to work? Have a very low marginal tax rate when you go to work. We do just the opposite. The FICA tax gives you a very high marginal tax rate as soon as you get a job. Ask any young person, the first, how many of you had that shock the first time of getting a paycheck? Well, raise your hand. If you got a paycheck and you were stunned how much smaller it was than you thought it would be? Okay. Five. These rules apply from childhood throughout your active life. In a few weeks, we're going to see a great entrepreneur on uh, a videotape who talks about he, he went to work when he was nine or ten years old because he wanted to buy a pony. Okay. It turns out in a recent Wall Street Journal study, or a Wall Street Journal report of a study, over half of all the first generation millionaires they interviewed had their first job by the time they were 10. Maybe a lemonade stand, it may be cleaning up around the yard, it may be uh, carrying newspapers. But notice how different that is from the welfare state mentality. And can you imagine what trouble I'd be in if I said every, every poor child should actually be earning money? Gingrich wants to exploit child labor, return to, you know, return to 19th century coal mines. <laughs> I just threw that in so the reporter who's distorting the class can go ahead and do it with, have some help. Uh, you know, and yet, when, and yet as a matter of pragmatic reality, when you see a study that says over half the first generation millionaires rose because very early in life they acquired the habits. And then you start talking to middle class parents. Do your kids earn their allowance? But just think about it. The families that are healthiest, I'll bet you they earn them, they don't give them. I even know millionaires who, whose parents made them work for their allowance to instill the habit. You aren't given this money, you earn it, then it's yours. If it's given to you, then it's really not yours. Then it's your mom or dad and they have the strength. But if you earn it, it's your money. Now, if you're physically or mentally challenged, you should receive the best possible rehabilitation and assistance to lead the fullest possible life. And as I said earlier, I really feel very, very strongly about that. Seventh, the key is not a big leap. It is one day at a time with continuous improvement. That's the key to success. You've got to do a little bit every day. You've got to try to improve every day. You don't get this done in a big jump forward. You get it done one step at a time. And again, every time you run into people, they say, well, that doesn't get you very far. No, but it's the right direction. It's the right movement. There's no hamburger flipping job. Any job beats welfare because it's the step, it's the beginning, it's where you get started. Now in that framework, 
you want to build on opportunity and success, not focus on problems and failure. This is going to be one of my greatest challenges this year in the Congress is convincing our committees to have hearings on success. What are the ten best addiction reform programs in America? What are the best, ten best alcoholic programs in America? What are the ten best small inner city schools in America? What works? 